Good morning, everybody. Dr. Gillard here. You got it. It is our last lecture. It's Thursday, week 10, spring 2020, our last GIGU lecture. Here we go. Star of the show, Crohn's disease. I don't know. We have some ulcerative colitis. I will see how far we're going to get with this stuff. Sometimes just abbreviated CD. It's a granulomatous inflammatory disease. So it can start out with inflammation and then it can kind of spawn into granulomas as a result of that inflammation. Can affect any part of the elementary canal or elementary tract from the mouth to the anus. It can even affect the spine. We'll talk about the extra intestinal manifestations of this disease. There is no cure for it. Although the treatment's gotten better, there is no cure. In fact, we don't even understand 100% what causes it. Crohn's disease is a member of the inflammatory bowel diseases. A lot of research just talks about inflammatory bowel. And inflammatory bowel diseases include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And then there's another inflammatory bowel disease that doesn't actually fit into those two categories. They just call it inflammatory bowel disease unclassified. In a nutshell, Crohn's disease is a wicked inflammation, a transmural inflammation. What's that mean? Transmural. We've talked about that somewhere along the line. That means it affects all three layers of the intestinal wall. It could be the large intestine, could be the small intestine, could be the rectum, could be the anus, could be the esophagus, but they all have the same three layers. So it's a nasty inflammation. The other characteristic is it skips around. It may hit the colon, the proximal colon, and maybe the esophagus. I mean, it doesn't usually do that, but it, it's, those are skip lesions. Maybe it hits the the distal ileum, and then the proximal ileum, the duodenum. Ulcerative colitis doesn't do that. There are no skip lesions. It's limited also to the colon. It's also limited to an inflammation of the mucosal layer, but it can be a severe bleeding type ulceration. It can really get infected. And unlike Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis about a third of the patients who are affected will actually need a surgery to remove that diseased part of the colon. As I said, the pathophysiology is not completely understood, uh, but there are three kind of contributing factors that are invoked in this disease. There's a genetic connection, environmental connection, and an immunologic connection. We'll go over the genetic and some of the environmental factors. And uh, whatever it is, it is a wicked infection of the entire intestinal wall. It can even affect outside the intestine. We'll look at this condition where the fat starts to get really, really thick in the diseased intestine and participate in the inflammatory that reflex. That's right, the lipo or the um, the adipocytes can actually become involved in the inflammation in this condition. There are three classic symptoms. We'll go over some other ones, but I'm going to repeat these when we do. Uh, the big one is chronic diarrhea. Almost all patients with Crohn's disease have chronic diarrhea. This is the gold standard symptom. Chronic bouts of watery diarrhea. Not necessarily bloody though. Abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, you think more ulcerative colitis. Uh, abdominal pain, so they have stomach pain of varying intensities. Could be bad enough to send them to the ER if a obstruction occurs. And weight loss, because they don't want to they don't want to eat. Their stomach's always upset. And they could have, I could have added malnutrition in there as well. These symptoms in some patients is there all the time. In others, it only comes during flare-ups of the symptoms. I should probably, let's see. Got my backup camera rolling so I have an idea. I don't want to go too long. Um, so Crohn's disease is the number two 
most common, or, or the number two, I mean, the most common inflammatory bowel disease, there's really only two of them, right? Or there's three of them. The other one is rare, the kind of, the one that doesn't have a category. So in adults, you're more likely to get alterative colitis than you are Crohn's disease. If you're a kid, it, uh, alterative colitis is the first in children. I need to fix that. Number seven, add in children. All right. Um, and Crohn's disease. Oh, no, I got that right. Sorry. Let me I better put my glasses. I'm trying to do this out my glasses. Uh, alternative colitis is the first uh, disease, yes, in adults. In children, the number one Crohn's disease, if a kid's going to get it, it's going to be more likely to be Crohn's than alternative colitis. And uh, an accurate assessment. So what's the prevalence and incidence of this? It's really difficult to tell throughout the world anyway because everybody's using different criteria. So it's hard to get a handle on this. Uh, but common number thrown around is 20%. Or not 20%, sorry. Well, let me read the slides. The prevalence of Crohn's disease continues to be on the increase, and alternative colitis as well. Uh, there's a famous Scottish study uh, which ran 40 years and had a pretty good retention rate, uh, and it found that Crohn's disease increased in the population, the Scottish population, by 500%. So that's crazy. It's definitely an ulcerative colitis uh, on the way. We're not sure what's happening could be Western diet. Some of the more leading theories are some environmental factor. Environmental factor is at play. Prevalence of Crohn disease in North America is thought to be about 0.1% of the population. So about one out of every 100 patients or people will have this disease. I've known several students who went through the program who have been affected by this and ulcerative colitis. Right? Remember, in adults, this one is a little, not the usual. Ulcerative colitis is a little higher. A risky time for Crohn's disease to strike the third decade. So many of you are in your 20s. Third decade of life is a risky time for this. And the 60s, my decade of life, is also a, ris a risky time for this to develop. North-South gradient. This is interesting. Uh, and this this holds for alternative colitis as well. So there's two research groups, uh, one in France, I believe, and one in the United States. Both, oh yeah, there it is right there. Both of these, about the same time, studied environmental factors on Crohn's disease, and they noticed that people who lived in the south of France, in the south of the United States, closer to the equator, more sunshine, were statistically less, uh, statistically less likely to develop Crohn's disease. And so the theory is that something about the natural production of vitamin D has some protective effect against Crohn's disease. And they're still studying this right now. What are the key diagnostic features? I mentioned these quickly, but let's make it more official. Skip lesions. Crohn's disease tends to strike discontinuously. So it'll hit part of the part of the colon. Let's say it hits the proximal colon, uh, and then it hits maybe four inches or six. Oh, I guess I said it here. Six inches of the distal ilium will be affected, and then eight inches of the transverse colon, maybe a little bit of the rectum. So it skips around and strikes, and that's not true of alternative colitis. It doesn't skip regions. It'll where where it strikes, that's where it'll be. It won't be all over the place like that. How does it cause pain? Well, it's an inflammation, and therefore inflammation causes swelling and fluid, and that can stretch out the tissue and stimulate stretch receptors, which causes abdominal pain. It can be quite painful. And that's directly, indirectly, it can lead to scarring. Uh, and you could get a small bowel obstruction 
or a colon obstruction from this. We talked all about uh, obstruction and all its sequelae. So that can also happen from these. Where does it like to strike? Its two favorite targets are the distal ilium. Right? Oh, what is that? That should be popping up some ears. Oh, no. What's in the distal ilium? Our friends, the Kabam receptors, right? So this is associated with a B12 deficiency. But about 35% of the cases happen isolated in the distal ilium. Another 35% of the cases happen in the ilium and the colon together, usually the distal ilium and proximal colon, but it could be anywhere. And 15% of it affects just the colon. And that can be confused with ulcerative colitis, of course. And if it affects only the colon, it's been given a special name. It's called Crohn's colitis. Crohn's colitis. What about uh, anal and rectal involvement? It can definitely occur there. The prevalence is all over the map on this. I've never, well, I've seen, when we talked about the gastritis, right, we saw some crazy AKAs and a mess with that. Uh, but the prevalence is all over the map with this thing. Probably the best paper I looked at says, it says the span is anywhere from 4 to 80%. I think it's probably about 40% of people have some involvement uh, of some kind, whether it just be a fistula uh, or maybe an elephant ear. We talked about those in lab, right? Uh, but it is very common to be in the anal region, anal canal, anus, in the rectum. The jejunum can be hit, but it's pretty darn rare. Same with the stomach and the esophagus. It can be affected in some people, but that's not the usual. Okay, so those are rare. But now we have this concept of extraintestinal manifestation. This is high yield board stuff, extraintestinal EIM, AIM, or EIM. Um, this is a big deal, so we need to talk about this. Um, sometimes it's called inflammatory bowel disease arthropathy. And it means that another part of the body, not independent of the GI tract, is also by being hit by an inflammatory disease. Yeah, so that's crazy. And in fact, again, the research, some studies show up to 40% of people with Crohn's disease also have extraintestinal manifestations, like they have an arthritis in their knees or in their ankles are the two most common places for it to show up can even show up before the the intestinal com, uh, component uh, comes to life. So it can be really tricky to diagnose this, but uh, uh, the mainstream books say about 25%, a quarter of people who develop Crohn's disease will either get or already have extraintestinal manifestations. It also That's also true of ulcerative colitis, but those affected by ulcerative colitis don't tend to get the the EIM quite as often. Where are some of the favorite targets? The most common spot for extraintestinal manifestation of either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is the musculoskeletal system, especially the axial skeleton, and we'll look at that in a minute. But there's skin lesions. I, hit, I took slides out. I have I have I don't have enough time to teach dermatology, so I've been I have enough slides for two full quarters of worth of classes, probably twenty classes, but it's not as common, so I took them out. But you can get derm dermatological skin lesions from an infl inflammatory attack. It can attack the liver, hepatic system, the pancreas, the mouth, the biliary system, the gallbladder or the common bile duct the eyes, the kidneys, it can really be a big pain of some of these organs. But the most common is that musculoskeletal system. Which comes first, the intestinal inflammation? Usually the intestinal inflammation shows up first, and then later on they start getting aches, stiffness in joints, usually the knees or ankles, and uh, the, the extraintestinal manifestation will come on later. What's the most common target for extraintestinal manifestation of, of Crohn's 
or the inflammatory bowel diseases in general. Uh, it's but the musculoskeletal system is by far the most common spot for these things to show up of both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Uh, even going even further into that of the musculoskeletal system, the favorite spot to attack is the appendicular skeleton. Going even further, the knees and ankles are the number one spot to get attacked by by extraintestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease. And the prevalence, again, the book's like around 20% or so, uh, but uh, 10 to 40% of people with Crohn's disease, as we said. Isn't that what we said back here somewhere? Oh, it was 40, well, it's a renal involvement. Yeah, they need to kind of get one number, their act together on that. Um, but yeah, it can be a problem. Let's see, where'd we leave off? All right, some fun facts about extraintestinal manifestation. A one factor that increases your chances of getting an extraintestinal manifestation, like a arthritis of the knees, is if your Crohn's disease is really bad. In fact, it's so bad that you actually had to have a bowel resection uh, because it was so bad. That's a bad sign. Another fun fact, if one... If you do develop, let's say, your knees, arthritis in your knees, then you have a 25% risk of developing another extra intestinal manifestation. Maybe arthritis starts in your ankles, or maybe it starts in your liver or something like that. There's our friend clubbing again. Look at the clubbing associated with Crohn's. 38% in this and some of these some of these GI books. So clubbing, we talked about that in CVPP, but it's about 38% of people with Crohn's disease, 15% of pizza, people with ulcerative colitis. We won't rediscuss it, but it's a growth factors are released in the distal nail beds, and we're not sure why they get released. Uh, possibly one is a response to hypoxemia. The blood is not oxygenated enough is one theory. Although, here's the deal breaker, Crohn's disease has, unless it's affecting the lungs, which it usually doesn't, has nothing to do with it, yet they still develop clubbing. So we don't really understand what causes this clubbing. Um, if it does attack the skeletal system, we have a new word. It's And this has some AKAs. But if you get an arthritis of the knees and you have concomitant Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, then you are diagnosed with having intropathic arthritis. Intropathic. Intro, what does that mean? That's intestine. So it's an intestinal pathology has spilled over and it's caused a inflammation and destruction even of the joints. There's two main divisions of musculoskeletal ma uh, manifestation. There's the peripheral arthropathies, sometimes called peripheral enteric arthropathy, and there's the axial enteric arthropathy. That's spine, right? That's the axial skeleton. So let's look at the peripheral enteric arthropathies. They occur in about 20% of patients with Crohn's disease. This inflammation process attacks the joints of the appendicular skeleton. Uh, particularly likes those knees and ankles. Starts out as a pain and a stiffness. Pain is called arthralgia. Patient has arthralgia. That means painful joints, stiffness of the joints. I could have added uh, hot to the touch. They might even be red or hot to the touch, which indicates inflammation. They might be erythemic as well. Matter of fact, I think I just made this slide this morning. So let's add 22. We could add some work to that. Um, and yeah, and then without treatment, if you don't catch what go on anti-inflammatories, 
you can get destruction. That inflammation can start to eat the joints away. And then you've graduated from a arthralgia to arthropathy, which means destruction of the joints has occurred. It can be seen in patients with ulcerative colitis, but not as quickly. So for like the fourth time, you can know that question's coming, don't you? Loves the knees and ankles. Uh, much more common in the knees and ankles in it appendicular skeleton than the axial skeleton. But we will look at the, likes those SI joints too. How do those knees look? Have you guys had enough soft tissue? You probably have in hard tissue. Where's the joint spaces? They're gone, right? Where's the, they're completely destroyed. Uh, so we got new bone formation. We got some osteolytic like bubbles, some arthritic type bubbles indicating destruction. So yeah, this is a uh, this is a patient with Crohn's disease and uh, they got worse and worse. Nobody figured out that it can affect the knees and his knees got destroyed and now he's in a wheelchair because of that. Okay, what about the spine? So the axial skeleton can also, not 20% of the time, but about 7% of the time, people with inflammatory bowel disease can be affected. And yeah, 20, we said that already, 20%. Uh, when it does occur, it really likes the SI joints. Um, but it, if it hits the SI joints, it causes an inflammation of the SI joints, which is called a sacroiliacitis, sacroiliitis. It can also affect the zygopotheseal joints or the facet joints, which everybody else in the world calls it. Uh, it can, and it can cause a spondylitis. So, yeah, spondylitis means there, there's an inflammation of the Z joints and destruction as well. Early patient symptoms, uh, they usually come on, and this is, we're talking about axial, extraintestinal manifestation of inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah, it comes on, they get stiff in the morning with their back, uh, they're it kind of gets better as they go on through the day. Uh, improves with a little exercise in the morning, a little stretching, but it gets worse and worse and worse to the point they become disabled as the joints become destroyed in the spine. It is Crohn's disease-related spondylitis. In other words, intropathic arthritis. Uh, is one of the seronegative spinal arthropathies. Remember, I had you memorize this list way back in first quarter? Well, now it's coming back, so it should be easy for you. Uh, so if you're a member of seronegative spinal arthropathy cluster, that means that blood work will show, usually show a positive for HLA-B27 antigen, and it'll also, you'll test negative for rheumatoid factor. I think we explained that. You probably had that by this point. Uh, and don't, let's not forget the other, the members of this group, right? I do like this slide. Most common, the, the ringleader of the seronegative spinal arthropathies is ankylosing spondylitis. Now, this has nothing to do with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. These people are not at risk. Uh, psoriatic arthritis. Uh, but here's the here's where our category fits in inflammatory bowel disease associated spondyloarthropathy, aka intropathic arthropathy, and you'll learn probably different teachers will give you different ones of these. But here here are all the AKs: intropathic arthritis, intropathic seronegative spondyloarthropathy. How about just Crohn's disease related arthritis? Makes more sense, but that, they won't say that. Uh, again, Crohn's disease is the usual cause of this, and ulcerative colitis can be, but not usually. The other members of this seronegative spinal arthropathy cluster is Reiter syndrome, pencil in a cup. Remember the Reiter pencil in a cup? And reactive arthritis is the preferred AKA nowadays, Whipple's disease and Beckett's disease. So you know a question's coming from this slide, right? It's so easy. Blank is not one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, right? And you're getting used to my questions by now. 
Um, it does love the SI joint. As I said, the axial extraintestinal manifestation of the inflammatory bowel diseases, if it's going to hit the spine, it's going to show up in the SI joints more likely than not. It could hit the Z joints, but not as likely. It probably will hit the SI joints. So in that case, it's hard to differentiate from the other seronegative spondyl arthropathies, especially ankylosing spondylitis, which is the most common. Here's a 38-year-old who came in with a history of low back pain, no incident for the development of back pain. Uh, he does, does have chronic stomach upset, so chronic dyspepsia, and uh, with chronic diarrhea on and off. Can't think of a reason for his back pain. Examination showed pain and tenderness when you poked around in the SI joints. You took a radiograph. What do you think? Oh, I heard some of you. Some of you are thinking like like spine care professionals, right? Do you see a problem why he might also have back pain? Come on, one of you's got to get it. Somebody got it. Robert. Robert got it. See the slits right here? What's that? Not supposed to have slits like that. Yeah, facet tropism, right? You're supposed to have coronal facets here. Instead, he's got... He's got really sagittally facing facets here. That's a cause of chronic back pain. But anyway, look at the SI joints. There's no clear line in these SI joints, especially this one on the right. So these are being destroyed by chronic inflammation. All right. Um, so multiple joint arthropathy. So about 5% of Crohn's disease patients present with multiple joints affected and that it could be either a plausiarticular or polyarticular arthropathy. Remember arthropathy means there's destruction of the joint. What's the difference between polyarthropathy and a plausiarthropathy? Plausi means that there's less than five joints affected. So you got a wrist joint and a knee joint affected or you got a metacarpal phalangeal joint affected uh, and a carpal joint affected. But if you have a whole bunch of them, then you, then you have a, par, a polyarthropathy. And that's got to be greater than or equal to 5. Right? Arthritis means inflammation. We said that. Yeah, ulcerative colitis doesn't usually do this, but could, but usually not. The arthralgia is also typically mirror the flare-ups of symptoms. So if you have a flare-up of, we'll learn Crohn's disease, some people have attacks of it, and they can go for months or even years without an attack. And when the attack comes, then the arthropathy, the arthritic pain occurs as well. So those two seem to be related. That's always a great question to ask people. What about the ideology? Uh, it's not fully understood. There's no question it's a wicked inflammation that develops. But the $64,000 question is, what, what causes? Why is there inflammation? Is it a bug? Is it autoimmune? What is the deal? And so the theories of this are all over the place from superbugs. We'll talk about a couple of these and dysbiosis where you get a disturbance of the good versus the bad bacteria in your gut. And uh, yeah, so let's actually look at some factors which increase the chances of developing Crohn's disease. So again, there's three main categories of risk factor. Genetic, uh, with gene mutations, environmental factors, and immunologic. We won't look at those, but we will look at... I mean, we'll talk about some of them. They're kind of in here a little bit, but we're sticking mainly with genetic and environmental factors. Genetic factors, so mom or dad having a first-degree relative who has Crohn's disease... And that's got, you're not by someone who's adopted, right? A blood relative. You have a 50% chance of, um, oh no, they share 50%. You have a tenfold higher chance of getting it uh, than somebody normally walking down the street has. So you're 10 times at risk, which is significant, right? Even two or three times is significant risk. But 10 times is quite high, so you have a pretty good chance of getting it. Uh, about 20% of Crohn's patients have a family member that's affected. 
if you if your background if you if your hereditary or if your ancestry is Eastern European Jewish from that region, you have a three times those these people are at risk for all sorts of things. These um, they come up for all sorts of things. Uh, monozygotic twins, so identical twins, have a concordance rate of 67%. You might need to add that to your vocabulary. What's concordance when you're talking about twin studies? What's concordance mean? If one twin gets it, the other one, the other twin gets it. So there's a 67% concordance rate, not 100%. So that definitely indicates there's definitely some genetic factors involved with this disease. We know of one gene, and I cut a lot. There's other ones. I cut a lot of stuff out of here. It may not seem like it to you, but I did. Uh, there is the old uh, the old Node 2, as I used to know it as. Uh, they changed the name to CARD15 gene mutation. So back in 2001, two independent groups almost at the same time found the same gene mutation on chromosome 16. And uh, people with this mutation, specifically in the gene called CARD15, they used to call it Node 2. I don't know why they changed it. But you might see on a board, especially a chiropractic board, it might say a Node 2 gene. But So you should know the two AKAs. CARD15 and Node 2 are AKAs for each other. We'll try to use CARD15 now. Uh, but yeah, they both found that people with ulcerative colitis or people with Crohn's disease had this mutation. Not all of them, though, but a good chunk of them did. Strangely, people with ulcerative colitis, the gene doesn't appear. So it's not related to ulcerative colitis. So they're definitely two different disease processes, although they share similar inflammation. Um, some more specifics, CARD15 gene mutation. If you have one copy of it, so if you're heterozygous for this gene mutation, that people who are heterozygous show up in about 50% of people with Crohn's disease. But even healthy people, 20% of it shows up as well. So there's kind of a high false positive, right? The specificity kind of sucks on this. Uh, nevertheless, it's just another factor. If you're homozygous carrier of it, uh, you have a 17-fold, that's really high, 17-fold risk of developing Crohn's disease over your lifetime. So uh, might be worth, I think 23andMe does test for it, card 15, if I remember right. What the heck does this gene do anyway? Well, some familiar stuff. It makes some protein products when it's expressed and when it goes through the central dogma, right? It's read by the RNA polymerase, it makes the mRNA, it swims out of the nucleus, it finds a ribosome, it's transcribed by the ribosome. That's the process of transcription into a protein. So if that gene is mutated, um, what does that gene make? So it, one really important thing that it makes is it makes part of the, the protein that makes up a toll-like receptor or a TLR receptor. And this TLR receptor is found on the sentinel cells, super the front lines guarding our immune system from evil. Uh, and these are the antigen-presenting cells as an AKA for sentinel cells. These are the dendritic cells in the skin, the Langerhans cells. And these are the macrophage and monocytes to name a few of them. But they have this little receptor. Here's a cartoon of a macrophage with uh, the TLR receptor. And there's many different types. There's two and six. We won't get, I don't know if Dr. Doe got that deep into it, but we'll just keep it general. Um, but yeah, so what do they do? They grab bugs and viruses. They spot this monocyte will swim over and it'll grab onto a bug virus and it'll latch onto it and it'll swallow it and present it up on a pole. Remember that and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, if your card, if you have a mutation in the card 15 gene, you make a dysfunctional toll like receptor, and therefore you have monocytes and macrophage that aren't very good at grabbing these bugs like they're supposed to. I mean, this is the front line. You've just let bugs go through the front line and get deeper into, if we're talking about the intestine, deeper into the submucosa because your front line 
kind of in the lamina propria these guys first show up uh, is not very good. All right, so let's back to bacteria infiltrate into the intestinal wall. Therefore, bacteria can grow wild in the intestinal wall, which can spark. Uh, by the time the big troops see it, you'll get a huge inflammation. But it's not on the mucosal layer anymore. It's not on the outside. It's got a late start, so the bugs have really built up an army. So you get a wicked inflammation because of this. And then the swelling and the stretching of the skin and mechanoreceptors and nociceptors causes pain. You get a tummy ache. And that's not all this CARD-15. If, if that wasn't important enough in and of itself, it also makes a protein a very important piece for the panath cell. Remember we talked about these panath cells, um, how they spit poison out. If bacteria come near them, they spit at them. They spit a poison, these little uh, bactericidal antibacterial proteins, specifically lysozyme and defensin, are spit. They sink into the bacteria and explode it. They kill it. Uh, but if they have a CARD-15 mutation, they don't work very good. They can't secrete these proteins anymore. And these bugs just go right between them and kind of give them the hand, laugh at them. You can't do anything to me. And then the bugs get in here deep, and now we got trouble. All right, so everything I just said, can't kill the bacteria. Um, you can't phagocyte. Remember, they can phagocyte as well. They can't do that. They're just useless pan of cells. So one, one theory in support of this is the density of panath cells in the crypts of Lee Raccoon, they are much more prevalent in the distal ileum than anywhere else. And guess where the favorite, one of the favorite spots for Crohn's disease to attack? In the distal ileum. How come? Because there's a weakness in the troops in that region. Panath cells are really deficient. Some environmental factors we can talk about. Um, so there's infectious agents, there's environmental antigens, uh, there is ha bad habits like smoking. Smoking is really an interesting one on this. Not so much for, it's bad for almost everything, right? But it actually, per it, it actually prevents people from getting ulcerative colitis. Remember that favorite, I remember you saw that house episode? I was laughing and laughing. I had to go online and look. I thought for sure they screwed something up, but no, it's true. People who smoke have a less tendency to get ulcerative colitis, but they have a greater risk to get Crohn's disease. So don't go start smoking. All right, and then there's gut flora, dysbiosis. There's imbalances between the good and bad bacteria. In fact, here's the smoking slide right here. There, it's how it's probably my favorite show ever. Miss that show. Although you can watch it online. You can watch it on Netflix. Uh, smoking is the strongest risk factor, or a, not the strongest, but it's a really strong risk factor for the development of Crohn's disease. But strangely, it's actually protective against ulcerative colitis. And there's the house episode, and house hates doing clinic duties, terrible with people and patients, right? He's brilliant, but not a people person. So he prescribed cigarettes to that person with suspected ulcerative colitis, and Cuddy went crazy, and no one else knew. They thought he was crazy, but they looked the studies up, and sure enough, it was, and it actually helped the patient. Uh, anyway, so what is the deal with smoking and Crohn's disease? We're not 100% sure, but the, those darn cigarette par smoke particles get into the bloodstream, and they soak in, they get into the bloodstream, and then they soak into the lamina propria, the submucosal layer, and then they have some effect which causes the tight junctions to relax. And bacteria can slide through. Remember, tight junctions prevent bugs from coming between enterocytes. And that's called leaky gut. You ever hear that term, leaky gut? I'm not going to get too crazy into this. But leaky gut means you have increased membrane permeability. So that means you have increased leakiness uh, between the enterocytes. And then you can get a huge buildup, especially of gram-negative bacteria are especially evil. Uh, they can even get into the bloodstream in this. But the smoking can do that. 
and make you susceptible to Crohn's disease by encouraging leaky gut. What's leaky gut? And that means you have increased membrane permeability between the enterocytes. All right, uh, increased bugs. Yeah, will trigger chronic inflammation. Uh, sugar's an interesting uh, appendicitis. So here's some some interesting stuff too. So people who have had an appendectomy before the age of 20, so even kids can have it occasionally, that's a really strong risk factor for them to develop Crohn's disease later in life. And another study, a couple studies have found that excessive sugar uh, in kids, refined sugar, somehow is thought to increase permeability, cause a leaky gut again, uh, of enterocytes to bugs. And they don't know the mechanism, but if you have a leaky gut, you have more bacteria, the bad ones can get in to the intestinal wall and spark an inflammation. Overuse of antibiotics causes a dysbiosis. What's a dysbiosis? It's a very broad term, and I'm sure Dr. Doe has talked about this. Uh, but it's basically, you have a screw-up between you have too many bad gram-negative bacteria around and not enough of the good guys around who balance out the bad guys. So that's thought to cause leaky gut syndrome. Anytime you have a dysbiosis, it goes with leaky gut. Use of oral contraceptives at slight increased risk. They don't really know the mechanism. The NSAID usage damages the intestinal mucosal barrier. Uh, and we've talked about that, as well as the gastric mucosal barrier, and it's thought to cause leaky gut. It makes it easier for bacteria to get in there. Um, here's, I love this picture. I know a couple parents just like this. In fact, they are my kids, a couple of them. Helicopter parents, let your kid get dirty, for goodness sakes. And there's research to bed. Don't be a helicopter parent. The kid's got to learn to explore and learn consequences of messing up and can't be helicoptering them. This generation, in my opinion, and I can say this because I have five kids and 11 grandkids. They're too too helicopterish. Not all of them, though. Some of them are fine. But anyway, so overprotectively diet and environment. There's research. I'm not just saying this. Uh, so there's research that shows that overprotective dietary and environmental practices can increase the chance of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Not as much, but both of these inflammatory bowel diseases. Examples, people go online and they read about celiac disease. I'm not going to get to that this quarter, but I have a YouTube video on it you should review. Uh, and yeah, so they go, oh my God, I don't want my child to develop celiac disease, so I won't feed him or her wheat or rye or barley because I don't want to cause that. And then they don't get exposed to that stuff. Having an overclean, super duper clean environment, kids need to get a little bit dirty. It's good for their immune systems. Drinking only purified water. I mean, we drink bottled water, but it's occasional tap water is not going to kill you. Uh, it's good for you. Uh, not letting the child get dirty. Got one daughter's in particular. Uh, cuckoo on that. Let the kid get dirty for goodness sakes. Anyway, you get the point. What about a superbug? There is a superbug. Uh, it's called adherent invasive E. coli, or AIEC for short. And this is a lot of research on this and Crohn's disease. Uh, so this superbug is able to get right past your gut wall defenses. Pana cells, the sentinel cells, have very little effect on the superbug. And when macrophages attack, not only is the attack useless, uh, but the bug actually grabs the macrophage and burls inside of it like a virus, and it replicates, and you can get huge populations of this bacteria growing very quickly, and it triggers a wicked battle. And so there's a lot of research on this. Normally we don't have, we have very little of this bacteria in us, but dysbiosis, we kind of talked about it. So again, quite a bit of evidence to suggest an intestinal and lately small intest or a um, even duodenal area seems to be particularly bad. That won't be in these board books yet. I was just reading that this morning. Uh, but a dysbiosis can be trouble as we've talked about. 
And specifically, there's a decreased diversity in the microflora. The bad bugs outnumber the good bugs. And we can get a little more specific. One of the phylum, um, this Firmicutes phylum, these members are not around. And these are the ones we know, Lactobacillus um, or Basalius uh, from yogurt and the Bacillies and all these guys. Um, they're not around. So uh, what's the deal? We don't know some environmental factor killing these off, but they left. They let the gram-negative bacteria run too wild. So bad bugs, if you have too many bad bugs, they can invade the intestinal wall, especially if you have a leaky wall, if the permeability is messed up through leaky gut, through any of those other mechanisms we talked about. And uh, yeah, to get bacteria in your gut wall, you're going to have a wicked inflammation. And that's what crone people have, wicked inflammation. Uh, let's see how we're doing here. Clinical findings. So some of the earliest findings are these aphthous ulcers. Aphthous ulcers. They, what are those? Those are like canker sores. We've all had a canker sore in our mouth before. Uh, AKA for this aphthous ulcer is a crone aphthae, aphthae uh, or uh, aphtha is singular, aphthae is plural, or aphthous ulcer. They're basically canker sores in your intestine or your, your large bowel, wherever the Crohn's is hitting. Sort of like a canker sore on the luminal surface of the intestinal wall. It's exactly what it all, exactly what it is. Uh, and yeah, when it first starts out, they're not as big. They're less than four millimeters. Let's take a look. I'll show you one. Here's a normal uh, intestine here. You can see the valvity appearance. What's that valvity from? What, what's those little, one little valvity thing? What's that? We talked about that already. That's a valve of Kirchhering, a.k.a. I think you learned it as plica circularis. Looks pretty good. How's that look? Not so good, right? See the ulcer? Looks like it's healing up. There's one big one, pretty good one there. There's one there. Those are just like little ulcers. Can you imagine? The ones in your mouth are painful. And these are painful as well. There's no seoceptors in the, in the mucosal layer. Oh yeah, and they can get really, really bad. So here's much more patient who has much more advanced disease. They're even starting to get these little cobblestone appearance. See how we're getting some granulomatous tissue in here? And they're starting to, it's getting a little lumpy bumpy in here. Now that's an indication that Crohn's has been around for a long time when you get lumpy bumpy. They still have ulcers going on too, but uh, this is not, this someone's, I mean, this intestine is going to be removed eventually if this keeps going. They need to get their, maybe they haven't been taking their medication or who knows what's happening. But yeah, in the late stages, they can coalesce to form really large ulcerations. And uh, they can go all the way through the entire lumen or through the entire intestinal wall. They become a transmural lesion and they're associated with inflammation. So you have a inflammation throughout the entire intestinal wall. Uh, sometimes chronic aphthous ulcer formation, um, they can give rise, as I said, to this cobblestone. When you see cobblestone, that means that they have granulomas going on in there. Those are like scar tissue, clumps of scar tissue. So here's a more cobblestone appearance. You can see a couple aphthous ulcers here, maybe one here, maybe one scattered around here and there. But all in all, this doesn't look like what we saw, right? It's cobblestone. This is a late stage Crohn's disease. This is a car, really nice cartoon of it, but it can get this bad. Uh, early, another early finding, uh, these granulomas can, isn't that a late finding though? They can, the presence of granulomas, highly characteristics. Um, I think that's more of a late finding than an early finding. So let me get rid of that. I think it's more of a late finding, 63. Get rid of 
early because I think it's more of a late. You get the aphthous ulcers as the first thing that shows up. Um, but yeah, the, these ulcers, though, when they do come, the cobblestony look, uh, that's highly diagnostic of Crohn's disease. They can be found in any layer caused by, they can be caused by other disease processes, so not all, there's not always Crohn's disease. Uh, the prevalence is very variable, 15%. Are, are caught in Crohn's disease patients by capsule. Remember in the small intestine, we can't stick an endoscope down there. You have to stick a little endoscopy camera in there. It's got like four, five, six cameras. It's like a little ball of cameras. So 15%. But when you go in there surgically to take out the inflamed tissue, 70% are seen. So that tells us those cameras miss a lot of stuff. And they do miss a lot of stuff, including cancer. There's granulomatous tissue formed right here. Dr. Doe would like that slide. I won't test you on that slide. The classic late stage findings, so large ulcers with or without cobblestones. Then you can start getting flat out tunnels like the little ant farm we looked at in a lab. The ant farm, the bacteria can burrow tunnels through the substance of the intestinal wall. And uh, yeah, you can have sinus tract sinus tracts running through the walls. Uh, fistulas can occur between adjacent bowel because the bowel's looped around sometimes. You can get fistulas. and yeah, So those are more late stage findings. And we get this weird fat wrapping where the fat starts growing uh, around. But here's the cobblestone look and there's these little sinus tract infections. Some more late stage findings, stenosis, right? The cobblestone appearance will, granulomas, the scar tissue will build up and the lumen of the intestine will get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point you'll start blocking some of the fecal material flow and now you've got yourself a, uh, an intestinal blockage. And we talked all about that, right? The small and large bowel obstruction. And you guys are experts at that. Fat wrapping. That's where the mesenteric fat just multiplies like crazy and it actually invades uh, the, the bowel wall. The adipocytes can actually migrate in and help with the inflammation, which is really strange, isn't it? Um, yeah, and they have been shown to release, release tumor necrosis factor alpha even. So adipocytes can kind of morph, kind of like when we talked about atherosclerosis and how smooth muscle cells can become phagocytic and amoeba-like and they can swim or move out to the grusudopodia and they move out of the tunica media into the tunic intima to start eating oxidized LDL. Same kind of deal here. Really weird. What causes that scar tissue? Because they you can get a flat-out scar tissue forming. Did, was that even on there? Did I miss that? Yeah, you can get scar tissue. I probably should add scar tissue to 65. Interluminal scar tissue you can get. Interluminal scar tissue. Yeah, you can. What causes it? Uh, so we know a little bit about this scar tissue. It's an overproduction of TGF beta, transforming growth factor beta is the culprit for this. And the presence of inflammation, some of the cells release the cytokine, tumor necrosis, uh, transforming growth factor beta. Not, I was going to say tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is another pro-inflammatory cytokine, but it's a TGF beta. And this calls in fibroblasts into the area. And the problem is it calls in too many fibroblasts spit out type 3 collagen, which is scar tissue. And it's a good thing and a bad thing if you're healing if you need to repair one of those aphthous ulcers, you need to scar it shut. And that's great. That type 3 collagen is perfect for that. But for whatever reason, people with Crohn's disease have a he fibroblast heavy inflammation. Too much TGF beta is wildly overproduced. And you get crazy amounts of scar tissue, which can extend to the lumen of the intestine. Like this picture here. Uh, and so this is ripe for small bowel obstruction, right? How's the, f here's the fecal material coming through here. How's that going to get through there? 
It might not. Here's one that got tangled up, and now you got a blockage, and now you, we go back to my lectures on small bowel obstruction, or it can happen in the large bowel as well. Usually small bowel, though. And there is a very cool-looking CT of some kind, 3D reconstruction, showing some pretty bad stenotic luminy, probably from the lumen in this case, has been all scarred up. That's got to come out. It's pre-surgery. They have to cut that out because the patient's got blockage now. Here is a surgery of someone with Crohn's disease, and you can see we've seen this in, in the cadaver lab, all right, with the mesentery and the intestine, how it's connected to the intestine. We've never seen fat like this, and that's called fat wrapping in someone with Crohn's disease. Clinical features of Crohn's disease. So uh, the big three, again, we've already talked about way back at the beginning. We hit weight loss and malnutrition I added now. Uh, frequent chronic diarrhea, the most common, best symptom, almost all patients with Crohn's disease. If you don't have diarrhea, it's pretty hard to say you have Crohn's disease. It can happen, but it's rare. Uh, but then they can have constitutional symptoms, right? It just fe they don't feel good. They don't have any energy, uh, fatigability, no energy, fever, low-grade fever, joint aches and pains, myalgia, arthralgia. But the big three, there's where the question's probably coming from, those three. Symptom causes, well, it's the, it's the pain from the inflammation within the intestinal wall, simple as that. Uh, or from the ulcer formation, or maybe you got fistulas going on, or maybe you got obstruction secondary to this, the stenosis, the interlumen or stenosis, or the interwall stenosis. Lots of possibilities. A couple more definitions to add to your list, your vocabulary. One, this is called tenesmus. So that's when you think you have to go to the bathroom, either defecate, poop, or urinate, pee, and you sit there and you can't go, and you push and you push and nothing happens. That's called, that feeling's called tenesmus, tenesmus, okay? It occurs during defecation or micturation, that's urinating, and it's an ineffective and painful pushing and without success. There can't be success. If you poop something out, you don't have tenesmus. You have constipation. Uh, but if you, you feel like you have to go and there's nothing there to get out, that's tenesmus. And people with Crohn's disease do tend to have tenesmus. It's another symptom. Okay, uh, urinating, pain with urinating, that's called vesicular tenesmus. And they don't, Crohn's pa patients don't have that. They have rectal tenesmus is what they have okay so not this one's for urinary problems that's not for crohn's people should make a note of that one two seventy six to make that clear uh, less common they can have it in crohn's disease but it is less common or they can have it uh, in they have it in crohn's disease but less common in ulcerative colitis if the patients have rectal involvement of Crohn's disease, it's more common with that. Going back to what I said a long time ago, so 33% of Crohn's hits the distal ileum, and we did many lectures about the distal ileum and the importance of it because it has CABAM receptors or cubulin receptors, and those are the ones that can take intrinsic factor bound with B12, the intrinsic factor B12 complex, in to the enterocytes and get into the bloodstream. <clears throat> so if you get an inflammation, it's going to break those CABAM receptors and you're going to have a vitamin B12 deficiency because of it. So people with Crohn's disease can develop megaloblastic anemia uh, and from vitamin B12 deficiency. Pretty simple as that. And what are these other symptoms of intestinal obstruction? We talked all about those, but abdominal severe, acute abdomen, right? 10-10 abdominal pain eventually. Dehydration, bilious eminence if it's proximal. They probably are not going to have bilious eminence if it's down in the, in the distal ileum. 
Um, but if it's up in the duodenum, they sure can have bilious eminence. Uh, and then they have that, remember, that colicky, intermittent colicky pain comes in waves of crescendo. We've all probably had that, I think, before. I know I have. I know my wife has. You get that pain usually with you ate something bad, and then it relaxes. Having a baby is the same thing. The contraction occurs. It hurts like keck, and then it relaxes. That's colicky pain. Uh, blood leak. So it's pretty rare for Crohn's disease people to have blood coming out. So they don't have melina usually, hem uh, hematemesis. They don't have that usually. Um, they may have some occult blood, a little bit of leakage from the ulcers. Uh, so it's about 50% of Crohn's patients, you can catch a f occult blood uh, with a occult blood kit. So that's usually ulcerative colitis. They have trouble with bleeding. Uh, diarrhea, again, is the most common, most universal symptom. We've said that several times. Uh, the inflamed enterocytes, it's an inflammation. And what do cells do when they get injured and inflamed? They stop working. Either that or they work too much. In this case, they stop working and they refuse to take up water, which is one of their main jobs, take up sodium and water and spit out hydrogen ion and potassium, just like the kidney. It's like the principal cell. And they don't do that. So you get a diarrhea from that, too much water. Differential diagnoses. So there are tons of other things that could cause these symptoms of diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weight loss. Those are the big symptoms. Ulcerative colitis is probably in the top of the list. But irritable bowel syndrome, which, watch my YouTube video. I'm not going to have time to get to some of these. Uh, diverticulosis, diverticular disease could do it. Uh, heaven forbid, carcinoma of some kind. Uh, maybe it's just for medications. Medications can definitely cause chronic stomach upset while you're on them. And even if for a while after you come off from ischemic bowel disease from a from an embolism or some, some other beaver dam of uh, superior mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery, uh, infiltrative diseases like amyloidosis causes all sorts of trouble. We've talked about that. Uh, infectious could be a bug. I mean, that's a really common cause, right? Could have a bug irritating, causing inflammation of the enterocytes. Vascular disorders, Berger's disease usually doesn't, but it, I mean, we're getting kind of rare now. What about the treatment? I think we got what time? I don't even know what time it is. It's been over an hour, I think. Let's do just a little bit more. We won't get into alternative colitis, uh, but watch my YouTube video on that. Uh, there is no cure for Crohn's disease, so the treatment goals are to relieve symptoms, and most importantly, it's to get the darn flare-up into remission so you're not symptomatic, and then maintain Of course, you want to minimize the symptoms, but you want to get it into remission. The definition of remission means patients doesn't have stomach upset, no diarrhea, and you go down with an endoscope and it's all healed. There's no more aphthous ulcers there. It looks better. might have some cobblestone, which you can't get rid of, but all the ulcers are healed up. And then get the patient, if they've been going like this for a long time, get their nutritional needs taken care of. So one of the big drugs here is sulfasalazine. Sol like skull, sol, fa, or more like fa, like up, uh, sol, fa, salazine, sulfa salazine. Uh, discovered a long time ago, back in the 30s. Uh, it works better for Crohn's disease with some colonic involvement. Uh, but the goal is to snuff out inflammation and put that disease in remission, and that's what it does. You can use it to treat ulcerative colitis as well. And it's uh, in a suppository form or an enema. And you get four to six grams per day of this. Suppository is usually what most people do. And this has now replaced this uh, mesalamine. Uh, mes mesalamine is the big one has been around forever. And it's not recommended anymore. Uh, Sulfalazine is, is the key nowadays. You, this mesalamine is still used for maintenance therapy. You're going to be on antibiotics when you have a flare-up uh, because it is a bacterial, usually a bacterial inflammation. 
and you don't want that to get out of control, right? So you don't want to get septicemia from this. So antibiotics, in fact, there's two key ones that you usually take, uh, ciproxoflaxin and metronidazole are the big ones. Side effects continue to be a big problem, though, because unfortunately you, Crohn's disease causes stomachs up, a stomach upset, and these, these antibiotics can cause nausea, which Crohn's usually doesn't cause, as well as stomach upset, and peripheral neuropathies can start. So there's some big problems. Not everybody's affected, but some people are. Uh, glucocorticoids, so if you failed the other treatments or you can't tolerate them, then the steroids come out. And uh, prednisone is the big one for moderate disease. For the more severe, uh, it's not the prednisone is not the big gun, but that's for moderate disease, use prednisone. If it's really bad, Crohn's disease, then you pull out the big guns, the hydrocortisone, methylprednisolone, which is the depomedrol. There's a whole scandal history on that one. And prednisolone via IV. So there's some really powerful anti-inflammatories that could be employed if you have to. Uh, another one are the thyropurine agents. AZA uh, is... Uh, is a big one anti metabolites let's call it AZA as as lithopurine uh, and I could never say that one uh, used to tr use for both primary and maintenance care uh, it's about 50% in effective in patients who try it as a primary so you could do this before if you don't want to go to steroids because steroids can cause trouble too right we talked all about it Steroids, what they some people can do, it shuts off your HPA access. 60% uh, use it for remission control, uh, but there is a a warning on this one. There's an association uh, with Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has been popping up, so these are becoming less popular. But if you're suffering with an attack of Crohn, I mean, you'll try anything to get rid of it. Methotrexate has another uh, is another one used uh, for a super strong anti-tumor necrosis factor inhibitor. So it's an inflammation snuffer outer. Uh, it, for stubborn Crohn's disease, you can pull it out and try it. Uh, it's uh, been used to keep Crohn's disease in remission as well. It's also used. We've talked about it treating psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, they used to try it for sciatica, but the uh, the meta analysis show it doesn't work. Super expensive, so yeah. All right, I don't know about you guys, but I think that's probably enough. You have enough slides to study. Again, go watch my alternative colitis. I'm not going to test you on it, but um, should we get into a little? Uh, no, let's not get into. It. I think that's enough for you. All right, so great quarter. Did the best we all could do, and we'll see you around next quarter.